at the meeting. Um, Lana's moved us over to live session, live stream. Um, you guys are ready to start your meeting. All right, thank you, Leslie. Welcome everybody to Emergency Services Committee meeting. We have a draft budget, uh, sorry, a draft agenda in front of you. And I'd like to know, um, we're going to get a call to order, which I will do that now, and is 2.03 p.m. Um, approval of the agenda, could get a motion to approve the agenda. Kevin, okay. your hand is up. Okay, thank you. Okay, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Okay, next item is the minutes from August the 19th. Hope everyone's had a chance to review them. And could I get a motion, please? Okay, Norm, thank you. Okay, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Okay, number three, we don't have a delegation, but as you see that we do have Mr. Walkinshaw here today and he'll be presenting the new business item. Actually, he'll, he'll be presenting the uh, old business item, which is the MEMP plan. Um, update from districts and directors. I'd like to hold off on that one until the end of the meeting when we've done dealt with our MEMP plan. So moving forward now with new business, as I said, Mr. Walkinshaw is here today and he has got a PowerPoint presentation to give you an overview of the municipal emergency management plan and to answer any questions that, uh, that the committee <clears throat> members may have. So Stu, do you could take it away? Okay, just give me a second to share my screen. Is that showing? I've got a blank. There we go. You're up. Okay, good. So uh, since the last meeting, um, uh, Rick and Rob and I uh, have spent the last couple months uh, putting together the draft Municipal Emergency Management Plan, and that's what I'll present uh, to you today. Um, the new plan uh, is uh, comprised of six general sections, as you can see up on the screen. Section one, an overview. Section two, emergency response guidelines. Section three are all of the different position checklists for the ICS uh, uh, positions. Four, hazard specific action plans. Five are the recovery roles and procedures. And then there are multiple um, uh, appendices uh, within section number six. Some of the major changes that you're going to see in this new uh, municipal emergency management plan, um, as opposed to the previous emergency management plan, uh, is this one has been built to meet the requirements in the updated Alberta Emergency Management Act and the local authority uh, regulations. Um, it uses an incident command system model for the emergency coordination system um, a layout. It has several different terminology updates. Um, and in particular, some of those terminology updates um, that you'll see in this new plan uh, relate to uh, things like uh, changes um, from emergency operations center to emergency coordination center. Uh, changes from emergency site manager to incident commander and changes from the term disaster to emergency uh, as per uh, a new uh, terminology within Alberta. Uh, things like the Disaster Services Act have been changed to the Emergency Management Act. 
the Disaster Services Agency has been changed to Emergency Management Agency, and Disaster Social Services has been changed to Emergency Social Services. So those are some of the major updates uh, that you'll see. The last thing um, is that uh, it has been revised to what I'm referring to as the regional standard. So uh, the format of, of your new munis the, uh, municipal emergency management plan is very much the same as Banff, Canmore, Kananaskis Improvement District, Cochrane, and the summer village of Wipress now. So uh, the, uh, uh, the impact of that is that it's gonna help when you call your mutual aid partners in or when they call you in uh, to help them because uh, everybody will be working on the same format. So just to go through each of those six sections very briefly, um, section one is the overview. It starts with an introduction which speaks to the best practices um, in emergency management to guide operations, uh, responsibility and coordination uh, during an emergency. Section 1.2, uh, deals with the authority of the of the plan, and it speaks about the applicable acts and bylaws that apply uh, to your emergency management plan. 1.3, plan activation and termination, speaks to who may activate and terminate uh, this plan. 1.4 is the emergency response organization, and it gives you the overall layout of the site or the incident command post, support and coordination or the emergency coordination center, and policy and direction, which are referred to as agency executive. And I'll show you a chart on the next slide in just a second. And then the uh, 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 section 1.5 um, speaks to uh, training and exercises um, and the new Alberta Local Authority Emergency Management Regulation has specified that uh, all municipal emergency management plans must um, speak to you know, training and exercises and must meet or exceed you know, what is listed uh, in the, uh, by Alberta Emergency Management Agency. So that's been done. Uh, there is that... Uh, uh, the emergency response organization overview uh, that I was just speaking about. At the bottom of the chart, it shows the incident command post and the site. And that is what occurs uh, for, the, uh, for the MD of Bighorn, 95% or more of the incidents. That's all that gets activated. Um, when you move up to the next level there, uh, the emergency coordination center, they are there to support and coordinate for the incident commander. And you may turn the lights on in this facility in 3% or, or up, up, a 3 to 5% of the actual incidents that you guys respond to. And then up at the top, policy and direction, our agency executive. And they're the ones that, that set the overall policy and direction for the municipality in terms of uh, emergency management. Section number two is now where you're starting to activate and you're starting to open up the emergency coordination center. So 2.1 deals with the response priorities and they have been set as life, critical infrastructure, property, environment, and economic and social losses in that order. So uh, uh, first priority being life, second priority being critical infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Section 2.2 speaks about now when you're turning the lights on in the emergency coordination center, who, where, and when is the emergency coordination center activated? In section 2.3 talks about uh, the uh, procedures for a declaration, announcement, renewal, or termination of a state of local emergency. So it lays out the groundwork uh, for what you need to do and which forms need to be completed in order to declare or terminate a state of local emergency. 2.4 speaks about evacuation procedures, and that section 
has standardized or standardized the terminology as per Alberta Emergency Management Agency terminology. So it speaks about evacuation alerts, evacuation orders, and evacuation rescind, and it speaks about the procedures for each of those. And then in bright red, uh, this is not that evacuation plan that you guys have, have been having discussion about. Uh, section 2.4 is just a quick overview on the procedures in order to actually declare an evac alert, order, or rescind. It does not speak about all the details on, on evacuating publics from a certain area of the, of the AMD. Uh, 2.5 is information release procedures. And it talks about responsibilities, procedures, and tools. And it, um, it speaks about your um, uh, alert process in the AMD. It talks about Alberta Emergency Management Agency. And it speaks about social media um, and door-to-door -door, uh, processes. Uh, and then 2.6 deals with post-incident actions, uh, after-action reviews, and post-incident counseling or, or critical incident stress management uh, debriefs, uh, those types of things. Moving on to section three, this is the ICS model that we've been talking about for the Emergency Coordination Center. So it's a big, ugly looking org chart. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that it, it works on an incident command system model. Um, the ECC director is in charge of the Emergency Coordination Center. All of the boxes that are in bright colors are the ones that the MD is probably going to activate. All of the ones that are faded are ones that may need to be activated, but probably won't be activated or will be activated with a person that's already in one of the other boxes. So uh, Rob and Rick and I uh, had this discussion as we were going through it and the fact that uh, the MD doesn't have enough staff to fill all these boxes. And that's clearly understood. Um, so what we did is we decided to just highlight the key boxes that will probably get it activated on the majority of your medium to complex activations and then you can fill the others when and if necessary, perhaps with mutual aid partners. So those uh, position checklists, uh, uh, they give the responsibilities of each of those positions, who that position reports to, and then it gives roles for activation, operate, um, operational, and during demobilization. Um, so the steps and the check boxes that, you, the, uh, that each position may need to take. Section four are the hazard specific action plans. And, and those six action plans that you see listed down below there were the ones that were ranked as high risk hazards from the hazard and risk of vulnerability analysis that was conducted back in July. Um, so between Rick and myself, we sat down and looked at these um, and uh, uh, we decided we'd put six in there as the high risk uh, uh, hazards. Section five, recovery roles and procedures are broken down by function. So it speaks to what each of the management ops, planning, logistics and finance and admin sections may be required to do during recovery uh, after a major incident. And then we go into section six, the appendices. And you can see there are seven separate appendices within that section. First one starts with the bylaw and legislation, which is the kind of the groundwork for your ability to do emergency management. Appendix two are all of the contacts and resources, the names, the phone numbers that are required uh, to get people to activate. Appendix three are several of the common standardized forms that get used in emergency coordination centers. 
Appendix four are what are what we've called emergency resource lists. Um, the MD has several lists for uh, items that are in their emergency social services kits, uh, items that are in their uh, communications trailer, in the sprinkler trailer, et cetera, et cetera. So we've put all of those lists into Appendix 4. Appendix 5 are the, are the results of the hazard and risk vulnerability analysis. Six are the, are the maps for the municipal district and seven is the distribution list and revision record uh, that you can keep track of any changes and where you've handed out uh, municipal emergency management plans. And that's it for the plan. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Rob and uh, I can take questions as required. You're on mute, Rob. Thanks, Stu, for your presentation. Um, I think we should just open it up to the committee members to ask any questions of Stu while we have them available. So please go ahead. Uh, this is Wayne. You hear me okay? Yep, yep. thank you, Wayne. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I. I taken the word version of this document and I put in some comments. I see some some minor errors in the first part of the document, just duplications uh, of sentences and whatnot. Um, I marked them up in Word using uh, 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 little tabs and markups. Um, did we want to talk about like I think there's really two parts of the document, the common part up front that I found just minor, minor uh, comments on, but then the uh, the back half that's unique to Bighorn. Um, I'm just curious what you want to do. Do we want to send it in to Rick perhaps where we're updating some of that, that information in the, the MD specific? So I'll, I'll turn it back over. Well, we should talk um, about your uh, your changes then. Or would Stu, you have a comment first? I was just going to say um, uh, 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 the, uh, the revisions are welcome. Um, but I would suggest the best way to streamline it is if anybody has revisions, send them in to Rick and then uh, Rick can pass them on to me. Okay, what format do you want? You want us, as I said earlier, we have the word source document. So you do want us just to put our little name tags on, on the comments and send the, the whole 7 meg file into Rick? Or do you want us to itemize them? Uh, no, I think as long as uh, as long as I can find the changes you've made in the Word document, whether you mm -hmm. use track changes or whether you just used a different color text, as long as I can find those changes that you've uh, recommended, um, send the 7 meg document. Yep. Excellent. I'll do that. I just use the comments, the function within review within Word to use, you know, add a new comment, show a comment. So if you just do show comments, you'll see on the right margin uh, the comments I added. Okay. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Um, are there more questions for Stu? I have a question for you, Rob. Sure. Given uh, what you've gone through in the last few days with Rick and Stu, uh, do you see any major uh, changes in uh, the uh, responsibilities of council? No, I, I do not. I mean, I'll preface that that I'd like to see uh, Wayne's changes when he sent them through to Rick, and he'll forward those to me also as well as Stu. But um, yeah, we were we were pretty we were uh, we gave this thing at least I would say six hours of solid review. So if the second set of eyes has a few more changes to it, um, that's also fine with us. Great, thank you. I I, I presume this will be uh, going to council uh, uh, as a um, a report to be approved by council. Yes, I'm shooting for December the eighth, your last council meeting of the year. Thank you. I just have a general question. 
and I'm looking at page 13 at the top. This plan may be activated in home or part by the foul. Okay, by the following. And I'm just wondering how the emergency advisory committee that's spoken about in the MD bylaw relates to that little section. I'm not I'm not quite clear on how the two go together. Well, that this is activation of the plan, not a state of local emergency. So if there's a, you know, any one of the, like a, a, could be a big fire going on and the incident commander from the fire could say, hey, we need more support here. I want to, <clears throat> you know, call in the members of the ECC team to, you know, so we need, you know, so it's just the plan being activated. It's not a state of local emergency. And so also any other member of that ECC management team. So that would be, um, for example, anyone from the, <clears throat> You know, in, in the operations uh, uh, section, you know, the chief there or, you know, basically any one of the MD managers uh, could um, say it's time to activate the plan. Uh, so it's just plan, it's plan activation. It's not a state of local emergency. Okay, so to go from uh, from plan activation over to local emergency, then the emergency advisory committee would have to do the paperwork and submit it to the province. Yeah, the next step up that then it does definitely involve uh, council or the the committee. Yes. Okay. Thank you. If I could follow up on that, Kevin, when uh, we declared a state of local emergency for the Devil's Head fire, I had to uh, call in the Reeve and the deputy reeve sorry the reeve and councillor ryan uh, to sign the declaration um, the, the requirement is for the reeve or deputy reeve and a councillor and they must sign the declaration the cao cannot sign it oh okay yeah i just wasn't quite clear how the pieces went together and that and I, is uh is listed in your emergency management bylaw um, how to declare that state of local emergency oh okay okay and there was one other thing that came to mind somewhere as oh i guess in the local bylaw as well number seven i see it's a director of emergency management, and then it's the deputy directors. And uh, are those two working as a team, or does the deputy only step in when the director is unavailable? Uh, I suspect it's in here somewhere, but I didn't see that part when I went through, or maybe it was in the part that uh, uh, the email said was okay, least important to pay attention to the section three. <laughs> and the answer to that is that it depends on uh, the complexity of the incident. So uh, the director of emergency, uh, I shouldn't say the director of emergency management, the ECC director is, is the person that is in charge of the, the emergency coordination center. And he or she may have a deputy director of the ECC. That deputy director or that deputy ECC director may be working the night shift while the actual ECC director works the day shift, or okay. they may be working side by side through the full 18 hour shift and the director says to the deputy i need you to look after the media i need you to look after the op section i'll look after everything else so i think the answer to your question is it could be one or the other okay thank you 
Uh, excuse me, Kevin, which page exactly were you looking at? Uh, uh, page 134, the second page of the MD bylaw. <clears throat> Oh, so you're looking at the actual bylaw. Yeah. Yes, that's where the question, I mean, that was the part that I was reading when the question popped in my head. So that was what I referenced. And you could, and which, uh, which um, uh, subsection was it uh, that you were speaking to? Seven. Okay, item seven, seven. Okay. in the MD bylaw. And that's on page 134 on our hard copies. So I'll leave that with you, Rick. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like cart before the horse. The bylaws is an appendix to the to the MEMP. So um, if the MEMP gets accepted by council, then we'll we'll know what, where to go with the bylaw, right? OK. Yeah, but I liked the answer I got. Uh, I mean, they may be sharing duties. They may be working together at some times. Uh, yeah, day shift as opposed to night shift would make perfect sense if it goes on for any amount of time. So, yes, it would be sometimes by yourself. Sometimes it would be working together as a team, which is what I hope to hear. except for some minor uh, some minor things like Wayne talked about. Uh, I think those were my two main questions. Well, Kevin, if you've got some minor things, why don't you let us know what they are, or are you, you going to just send them in? Uh, well, I just marked them on my hard copy, and I can't do it readily on the... Uh, on the Microsoft Word document because I'm too cheap to buy an up-to-date copy of Word since I use it very seldom. I'm still using my 2003 version, which is actually legitimate. Uh, yeah, I can uh, I can flip through and just say quickly the things I highlighted. Okay, one of the first ones I saw was in 3-5 or page 31. Okay. And later on, I figured out what was happening. The ECC 511. Uh, is on page 195 in one of the appendices, but at first I couldn't figure out where, okay, what ECC 511 was referring to, so that's not a problem, but going down to ECC 414, I see that numbering on page 184 and 186, so which page it's actually supposed to refer to, I'm not sure. Uh, which page are you on right now, Paul? Sorry, you're on 3-39, is that correct? Uh, no, the page in your numbering was 3-5, or in the overall numbering of the whole hard copy package, it was page 31. Okay, 3-5, yeah. Um. And under activation phase, yeah, down two thirds of the way in brackets is ECC 414. Yes. And if you if you flip to appendix A3, I think it is on page 184. Yes. You have ECC position log, and I think there's a second page with the same numbering. Correct. Okay, working notes is ECC. K414 as well. So, yep. Oh, I guess both of those pages just go together as one document then. 
They are. They're uh, so they get double sided. And uh, no, they were two separate pages in the hard copy. Well, well, yeah, they are in the in the Word document, but when they get produced on a photocopier, yes, you uh, you just double side them. Okay. Oh, and then the next item that wasn't clear to me is in section 4-5, according to your numbering, or page 115 in the hard copy. And... Is that pandemic? Uh, oh, it's the 4.3 flooding. Okay. 4.3 flooding over land or groundwater yep. procedures. The second line, contact Alberta's River Forecast Center. Uh, I took longer to find that than necessary in the appendix number two, because I was looking for Alberta River Forecast Center, and it's called just River Forecast Center in the appendix. Okay, that's a good so, point. Yep. So it might be worth correcting to make it easier to find. All right. Yep. On the very next page, uh, okay, 4 6, page 116, uh, it, on the second line, it, it accesses Alberta River Forecast Center again, which we've taken care of. But the atmospheric environmental services that's mentioned, I couldn't find that anywhere as in the appendices. All right. I'll look into that and I'll uh, clean that up as well. Oh, and just a general comment. Uh, there was okay, quite a few more common acronyms that are used throughout the document that are not listed on your acronym page. Whether or not they should all be included is, yeah, I don't know which way it should be, but I just made that observation. So, so would it be fair to ask you to to just put a, a list together of the acronyms that um, you can that you see um, and that you'd like to see a, a definition for and just uh, send it send it to Rick? OK, I will put together a list like many of the and, and what we might find, Paul, is that many of the acronyms um, are clearly understood by folks that will be working in the ECC um, yes. and, may not, and may not need to be defined. Mm, yes, yes, because I mean, the first half hour I was reading, I was looking at your list of acronyms constantly after that. <laughs> uh, most times I didn't have to look. Yeah, because one that I just happen to see right now is NGO. Okay. Yeah, non-governmental organization. I, I guessed correctly. And another one I'm seeing right now is PPE, but after watching TV for the last few months, that's now clear. Oh, and then the next section I came to was the pandemic alert section. And I just noticed that I got the impression this section was written before uh, this pandemic, uh, uh, because one thing that stuck out to me was when they talk about briefings or meetings, it's no mention of whether or not they're in person or if they are on a uh, yeah, over the internet or on phone. And we know during a pandemic, many things must be not in person. Very much so. So uh, uh, Rob and Rick and I had the same conversation. Okay. And at the end of the day, what we decided to do is to go with the current um, Alberta pandemic plan, uh, which is what you see in here. Okay. And and we all are under the understanding that after we go through this one, 
we're quite sure that there will be some significant updates to it. Okay. Yes, I kind of guessed as much myself. Uh, uh, the next thing that I'm seeing that I marked is on page 161 in, in, in Appendix A2. Uh, and in Section 2A, ECC First Call List, and the very first line underneath position, it's ECC director and then DEM. Uh, but in some places, it's uh, that person appears to also be called director of emergency management. Oh, that is the DEM. I wrote that in before I realized what DEM was. Sorry. Right. So. And again, uh, Rick and Rob and I went through this in, in some detail um, in our discussions there a few weeks ago. And so, and this will come out when we do the training workshops. But oh, okay. so I won't get into it right now in a lot of detail, but it, the, the ECC director does not have to be the director of emergency management, nor does he or she have to be the deputy director of emergency management. So oh, the, D okay. the DEM and the deputy DEM are um, uh, legislated by the Emergency Management Act and then they are enacted by in, in your bylaw. But the ECC director, you know, could be Kendra Tippy, or it, it could be one of your other uh, management folks in the NB. Okay. It, it could be the fellow that looks after, uh, it could be Bill Luca. Um, yeah. And so they don't have to be appointed as DEM or Deputy DEM. The only reason we've got DEM behind ECC Director is because Rick Lister is the DEM. Okay. So basically the ECC first call list will be the main people in charge, but who has which role is, uh, most of them are not clearly specified. And since we don't have enough employees in the MD to give a different role to everybody, uh, it can fluctuate as the situation demands is what I'm hearing. Very much so. If it's an agricultural emergency, uh, you might see Kendra Tippy as the yes. operation section head. Okay. Um, yeah. Or you might see Kendra as the ECC director. Okay. Yeah, because then that would be calling on, on her expertise in that area. Yep. Okay, the whole plan is making more sense to me. Mm. I'm just flipping through my sticky notes here, and that's all I'm seeing at this time. So thank you very much for the clarifications. Okay. Uh, Paul Clark, you have your hand up. I do, uh, uh, Rob. Thank you, and there's a uh, question for Stu. Uh, Stu, at the uh, beginning you mentioned that this will align with our adjacent communities like Banff and Kenmore. Uh, does it um, have any effect with our relationship with forestry? Uh, nothing at all, no. So um, the relationship with forestry, and, and I think maybe Rick could speak to, uh, Rick and or Rob could speak to this as well, but um, in, in the, uh, the hazard specific action plans, uh, you have a, an action plan for wildfire and or wildland urban interface fire, um, section 4.2. And one of the things that it states in there 
are that wildfires are the sole jurisdiction of Alberta wildfire management and will be managed by that agency using single command. And then it states that interface wildfires, so wildfires that are threatening buildings, um, are the jurisdiction of Alberta wildfire and the MD of Bighorn and may be managed using unified command. So that would be the one significant difference um, in the, and, and Alberta Forestry already understands that, that if the Devil's Head wildfire is gonna make a run at, at Benchlands or Jamison Road, they would go into unified command with somebody from the MD of Bighorn because your jurisdictional authorities are now involved in the incident. So uh, that's about the only thing that would have an impact uh, from an Alberta forestry perspective. Yeah, thank you. That's a wonderful answer. I thought that uh, at, at some time there would be uh, either an overlap or uh, uh, a um, partnership of some sort. Yep. Yep. And they, uh, uh, they, uh, they understand that clearly uh, in forestry um, and have, have practiced it significantly over the last few years since they've had some bad wildfires there threatening communities. That's great, thank you. And Paul, forestry, agri and forestry uses the ICS model that we're that we've become now what we're using. So we have a common vernacular when we're dealing with fires or any or an emergency. Well, that's even better news. The other thing that we did um, in in it after after uh, the after action review was done uh, on the Devil's Head wildfire by Rob uh, with with his folks there um, is uh, uh, I put another bullet in there uh, below the uh, the wildfire and the interface fire one that said uh, uh, one of the procedures is to request an Alberta wildfire management agency representative to attend in person or remotely to provide regular scheduled briefings to the MD Emergency Coordination Center. So uh, those are the first three bullets. Um, if it's a wildfire, it's Alberta Wildfire Management. If it's an interface fire, it's it's an overlapping jurisdiction and it's the MD and, and Alberta Wildfire in unified command. And the third bullet is that uh, uh, the MD is going to request Alberta Wildfire to either attend or provide regular uh, briefings remotely uh, to the Emergency Coordination Center. Thank you. I believe that happened, uh, Rob, uh, in the Devil's Head fire. We had, we did not have a representative actually in our EOC, but uh, we did have uh, no video conferencing, but we did have audio meetings um, with them at least once a day with forestry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Norm, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just a couple of real quick comments or questions. Uh, one was concerning resources. I think that on some of the lists towards the end of the document, there may be some other uh, resources available in the jurisdiction that uh, we could put forward, you know, both suitable for rescue work, that sort of thing. So if we, if we thought of something like that, or we saw another business that we thought could be a, a third, you know, a, a service provider for them to you, or and assuming that you folks would double check before you'd, like you'd validate that they're actually legit and appropriate, assuming that's the process. So if we if we think of other names for some of those lists, forward them to you, and you'll you'll do the due diligence to make sure they're actually legit. Or do you want us to do that before we even forward them? Am I making yeah, sense? One? Well, I was thinking, for example, page one sixty nine. I think it was 
you had a list of boats. I think a few people that you know do work for the uh, energy sector and they have boats that are you know uh, very appropriate for probably the emergency kind of work. They maybe could be on that list. I don't want to forward the name without checking them first, or I'll forward you the name and let you guys check. That so that that was. Uh, the question is, what's the process you'd like there? As an example. Yeah, so that's in Appendix 2 uh, that you're talking about, Norm. Page 169 is all I noted on my notes here. Um, Give me a second. One, 160. My page numbers have changed a bit because I've made a couple of revisions since then. But um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like under, under, under 2, Mike services and supplies we've got a list of boats and contact phone numbers Correct. um so uh, uh rick i think it's best for you to answer this one but my suggestion would be that if you've got some thoughts send them to rick and and then this is a living document this contact list and it gets updated every year by somebody uh in the md there okay the other the other question uh, it's been touched on already it's it's more about roles i was just curious you know the number of staff uh there's not enough staff for all the roles so there'll be dual roles etc got me thinking about some of the you know are, are volunteers in some of these boxes or uh are the roles described in this document all staff volunteers fall in you know below them somewhere outside of the document You guys want to answer that? Or that well, I would. It depends what's what's going on. I think. Okay. It's part of the reason why we're going for ICS system. If we get, uh, we need help in ECC. It's going to be much easier for us to say, hey, we need uh, we need some help in the planning section, which is a big job. If we have something big going on, and we could get people from our neighbors to to come in or another part of the province, right? Uh, so I think that would be my my best answer. I think is it's easy to request staff from other municipalities to fill the roles. It could yeah. could be even Canmore or whatever. I suppose depending on the situation. Then. Yeah. And and that, it got me thinking because I remember taking an I think it was a note taker course, and uh, I took with some other folks in the community here and. Um, I was just thinking where that would fit in, you know, if all of a sudden there was these note takers required to come in. I mean, the first thing you need is a half hour refresher on what the heck the role was about, even because it was so yeah. long ago. But, well, I think I think most of our volunteers, we we've got them in mind for as boots on the ground type people. So helping at actually helping at the reception center, probably uh, for most of our volunteers and things like that. So they're. That that's what I my thoughts are about that. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to go along with Rick's comment, there's quite a few K people from the communities listed in section OK appendix number two, and then number two E is listing quite a few uh, people by name who some of them have official title some of them are just volunteers and there's another section under two that i saw a moment ago and number two h community emergency contacts so 163 and 164 are the page numbers so we do have some people listed from the communities. We do, and they're likely going to be part of the uh, emergency social services for uh, evacuation and dealing with uh, uh, with people who are being evacuated from the from the emergency scene.
Kevin, do you have more questions? Because you're you're on mute. Oh, you're still on mute. I think I have everything that I had marked in my sheets I've already mentioned, but I will put together uh, uh, a bigger list of acronyms of ones that may be useful adding. Now, Wayne, how many yep. changes do you think you've got? I wonder if we should be going through them right now. Uh, we probably could. There's very minor changes in the first half of the document, maybe one or two, because uh, I cleaned up a few as we were, as we were discussing. Um, uh, I was just going to comment, a lot of my changes are in Section 2, Context and Resources. Uh, we okay. certainly can talk about it because um, I can see the uh, importance of adding a few in some of those fields. Um, we could talk about it if you like with the group. Well, let's go through the first part of the document. Okay. That was let kind of a, just, a key one for us. Yeah, let me just fly down here to see where the first hand sticks up here. And it was just a duplicate. It was really very minor. Where did that go? Let me just say show show comments. Oh, show comments. Find the next comment. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Get some of these dams. That's a big document. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too big. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, I got to jump to that section here. All right. Under, um, this is real simple, under dam release 4.1, ECC director, it's just a duplicate. You see how you say notify POC that ECC is activated? Two lines down, you say it again. I don't think that's different. Um, it's 4-2 on the document. I have the Word document open. I don't have our package open. Oh, I see, okay. 4-2, or it's actually section 4-1 called dam release. If you go under okay. ECC director in green, um, the fourth bullet seems to be a repeat of the second bullet. Yep, I got that one. Okay. Um, I had another comment on why, oh, sorry, um, under one of your flow diagrams. Why fire branch wasn't highlighted. Not that one, I'm gonna check here. And maybe this is just an explanation. Okay, on the um, on section, sorry, 3-3, it's a flow diagram. It's the uh, ECC Coordination Center, where you had under ECC Operations section head, where you bolded what uh, positions are typically filled. I'm not sure why Fire Branch is not. Isn't that kind of, I mean, that's kind of what, most of us here do. Um, was there a reason why, like emergency social services branch, when you read through that, um, I don't really see where it kind of points to stuff that the free fire departments do. Right. Like I know, I know we're under ICP typically, like the command post perhaps, but should not that fire branch be bolded, like staffed, I should say? So I, I, I would suggest that's a decision that you guys may wish to make. But in, in the discussions that Rick and Rob and I had, um, we look back at the ECC activations uh, that have taken place over the last several years. And we said, you know, in just about every single one of them, the main function that gets activated in the ops section is emergency social services. There's evacuations or there's evac alerts or something like that. Um, and all of those others, if it's a flood, then the fire branch probably doesn't need to get activated. Um, if it is a wildfire, if it's the devil's head wildfire, 
that is rolling towards uh, structures in Jameson Road, then yes, I would suggest you would activate that branch. But the discussion we had was which ones are going to get activated just about every single time that you turn the lights on in the room. And that's why we did that. Um, I don't disagree that a lot of times uh, uh, the fire guys are out in the field and they are what you referred to as incident command post or site. And yep, I would bet 98% of the time uh, the fire department guys are out there. Yeah, floods included, of course, right? We're pretty well out there for everything, whether it be a spill or a flood or a you know, yep. fire for sure. Yeah, but they may not need to have a, a body. And, and that was kind of the other question, is if you guys are all out in, in, in the woods with your boots on, <laughs> at, at, at acting as the incident command post, do you have somebody that you can send to sit in council chambers at the emergency coordination center? I was thinking of Rick. <laughs> That's okay. Well, and, and so <laughs> if you don't fill the box, it just goes up to the next filled box. Right. So you know, Rick may be the ECC operations section head. That's right. So Rick is also fire, police, health, engineering, environmental, utilities, and any other branches that are required. Okay, I understand. Do you think that maybe we should bold that box, guys? What do you think? The, th uh, uh, the fire branch box? Uh, like, I'm, I'm good either way. It, it's just a matter of what the MD is going to have enough staff to effectively uh, activate. I keep it the way it is. Okay. The one, the one thing we learned yesterday about the ECC and the ICS model is how flexible it is, Wayne. Mm -hmm. And because of that flexibility, we just mark down the ones that are most commonly used. Okay. But it doesn't preclude us ever having to activate a fire branch. Understand. That's fine. Okay, I'll just go down through some of those others here. Okay, the first, uh, the next one is comment on 2G. All right, and that is in the section two, oh, sorry, uh, appendix two, context and resources. Yep. And that's where you list the uh, emergency response, regional mutual aid. Yep. And maybe, maybe Rick can help me on this one. Um, most recently, we've been working a lot with Morley Fire uh, 165 station. I know it's probably federal, but why? I, I do believe they're a mutual aid or we're not treating them as a mutual aid. Why would we not put uh, our contacts for Morley Fire in, in the Section 2G? Um, what page are you on, Wayne? Uh, it's page 156 of the Word document. The table is called 2G as in Gulf Regional Mutual Aid. It lists Town of Canmore, Cochrane, Rocky View, KIS or KID, Mountain View, City of Calgary, Town of Amp, Clearwater, Redwood Meadows, but doesn't mention Morley Fire. Page or, 164 of the PDF. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the Word document. But yeah, yes. I got it there. Yeah, I see 2G. what you're talking about. Should I know they're kind of an eight to five fire department, but most lately they've been doing calls on weekends and after hours, like most recently the other day, right? So should they not be in this table or are they treated differently off First Nations lands? They're mutual aid still. We do typically do mutual aid to them, mind you. Well, I guess I don't I don't know. Um I guess they'd be a a resource. Um I I don't object to them being on there, but I, th I don't think we have a mutual aid agreement with them 
we have a uh, service agreement with them sort of thing. Okay. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, they could be included on that list for sure. Sometimes we call them first to see if they're attending, if we don't hear them on the radio or something like that, or they've been known to uh, call Jameson as well, direct, you know, the chief out there. So there is communications, but is it official? I'm not sure, guys. You know what? Communication is one of the key things. When we had the Devil's Head wildfire, their chief out there, um, I brought him into the discussions and so did, uh, and brought the RCMP in too. So everybody was in the loop after we'd had our briefings. Yeah, and to be honest with you, early on in the emergency, he contacted us, say, hey, what have you guys heard? Right. And I think shortly after he started working with you as well. But so um, they're out there. I think they, they if we if we can put them on this table, it'd be nice. I don't know if it's called regional mutual aid, if they have to be a mutual aid or if we change the title, perhaps. I don't know. It's, I'll leave it to the group. Yeah, we do not have a mutual aid agreement with, uh, with the First Nation. OK. Um, I'll send under 2-H, uh, community emergency contacts. Um, there's none listed for Jameson. Um, I probably might, I will talk to uh, Jay Fitt's wife. You know, her name just eluded me, um, but she has a Facebook group uh, for Jameson. Alice. Alice, yeah. So she has, a Facebook, she has a Facebook group for Jameson uh, residents as well. So I could certainly reach out to her to see if she wants her name on this list. Like what would it involve once they, once they have this, uh, the name on the list, is there any sort of specialized training or they need to go to meetings or they just need to, uh, to be available to, uh, to support? Well, the emergency contact section, that's, uh, Deb Grady's done a great job, you know, uh, in her role. So she's got her, her finger on the pulse here. Uh, I think all we have to do is give her, give Deb um, whatever, um, I didn't hear the name. Alice. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure they've met and uh, it's just a matter like we can get, put, get Deb to say, hey, you know, give Alice a call and see if she'd like to do that and we can figure out what kind of role. But, you know, notification is, you know, is very important. So uh, not everyone has our emergency alert or civic <laughs> alert and every little bit helps, you know, so. Okay, uh, do you want me to, shall I reach out to her and tell her to contact Deb? Yeah, sure. And then okay. I'll, likewise, I'll let Deb know too. Perfect. Uh, for your information, uh, Wayne, uh, uh, Deb and uh, Alice work together on the community services uh, committee. Yeah, that's that's what I say. I'm sure they know each other. So let's yeah. get her name on there then. I just feel left out. I see Ben Sands and Exshaw and every other community, but not Jameson. So uh, the very next uh, section two I is in India utility providers. Um, I think there's important one, in, and again, uh, there's a gas plant. That's, that gathers from H2S lines on Jameson and up the up the Highway 40 down there, Jumping Pound Gas Plant. I forget the uh, the company, but they do emergency plans with all the residents have for many years. It's it's changed names many times. Um, I think they should be on this list as well because, as I said, um, where I live, I'm cut off by a, a very high concentrated H2S pipeline, gathering pipeline starts out on the west end of Jameson, right kind of transits the whole Jameson, heads down to that jumping pump plant. And there's another line that goes up Highway 40 um, up in uh, Tom's area as well. So I should probably try to find the name of that company. I don't think it's on. Oh, I'm sorry. I stand corrected. It's called Centrica Energy. It's it's on there. Never yeah, mind. I think, yeah, that's the Centrica Wildcat Hills plant. Perfect. I knew it as a different name. So um, OK, I'll move on. I know it's Fish, Wildlife and Sheriff's. Once upon a time, our communication system, AFRAX, the system that uh, we are using and, and uh, starting to use even more, uh, AFRAX, Alberta First Responder Radio Communication System, uh, that's going to be the system we tie into. That's all the structure. So I wonder if we shouldn't put a support line in there as well, right? If we go on any of these emergencies and we're relying on our AFRAX radios and perhaps years down the road, we don't have our old conventional system, uh, it'd be nice to have a backdoor contact into AFRAX support. And it used to be Alberta Justice. I don't know who's running it these days, but um, that province-wide system, right? Yeah, so that's, so that's um, uh, it's Alberta Municipal Affairs. So uh, we'll take and put it uh, right below um, yeah, I, Justice okay. Officer General under Municipal Affairs. 
but you have a guy named Tom Harno, sir. Is he, well, he, you see the fellow that if I call and say, hey, the APRAC system is giving us all sorts of problems. Because I remember the APRAC system, they're supposed to, you know, on an outage, they're supposed to haul the trailer out there and set up temporary communications in four hours, blah, blah, blah. So is he the guy to contact if we have problems? or uh, is there well, a- no, no, no. So what I'll do, Wayne, is I'll put in an additional row underneath Perfect. Tom Harmos. Okay. That's a contact for APRAC. Excellent. And, yeah. Yeah, Tom, Tom is, de- is not, not the, the guy to contact. I think if we want something like that, uh, Wayne, we would request that from the POC. It's a you know the one-stop call uh, place, right? Yeah, that's actually probably. Yeah, you're right. Rather than lone wolfing it and going mm-hmm. direct to AFRAX, um, yeah, Alberta Emergency Management Agency would want to be contacted at the POC to get AFRAX to move on it. Yeah. So we should probably not put the AFRAX phone number in there then. Okay. Is it just for us to kind of remember that or somewhere within the document would we say that, I mean, communications is everything as we all know. So should it be listed somewhere that we uh, we work that through the POC or AEMA or whatever? Or is this implied? Uh, leave it up to you guys, whatever you prefer. <clears throat> Okay. Um, we can. Uh, I I can put a. I can put something in there under AFRAX saying, uh, contact the POC. Sure. <laughs> but that's only if there's issues with it, though. Yeah. Well, and there could be like, hopefully, we've got all our mutual aid partners set up properly on the radio, but. Yeah, no, it, it'll be operational. I, I'm okay with with uh, leaving it out then. We'll just deal with it locally. Yeah, it, it could. Maybe we should go back into the, this is, you know, this is a living document, right? So we can change it all the time. It's only appendix, right? So, yeah. um, but your points are, uh, you know, some of your points are well taken. Some aren't, but just joking. <laughs> uh, but we should maybe... Uh, think to where we could put that more in the uh, the actual plan as a as a reminder note. It'd be pretty important because we'll be talking between RCMP and AHS, and I mean that's standard operating procedure, so maybe that's not a big deal. But yeah, and I think that's a good point, Wayne, in that um, uh, uh, one of the very first things that is stated in this whole plan, if you go right to section one point one. It's uh, like right after the table, uh, right after the acronym in that in that gray box. It says this plan does not address emergencies that are normally handled at the scene by the first responding agencies. So uh, it it's not built for the 95 percent of the responses that you go for. Mm-hmm. It's built for that five percent where you open up the emergency coordination center. And that then is going to be when the POC would be involved as well. Okay. I think we mentioned boats earlier, but um, I just had a comment here. It doesn't Carkin RCMP have a power boat? You often see it stored there behind the uh, Carkin Fire Hall, unless it's managed by Carkin. Like you have Carkin Emergency Management there as well. I just wasn't sure if that was treated separately, but there is a Carkin RCMP power boat. You see it on Ghost Lake every now and then. Uh, yep. So all all the current names and phone numbers that are in here are what came out of your existing municipal emergency management plan. So okay. uh, I think, uh, like Rick was saying, uh, this appendix two is something that gets updated every year by mm-hmm. somebody in in the MD office. I my suggestion would be just get those things to Rick and. Uh, they can be added at some point in time. Okay. Fencing, again, this falls on the same thing that Stu just mentioned, but I think animal panels, we, we're just fresh off uh, animal emergency training. So it'd be nice to know where we can get uh, 
animal control panels kind of in a hurry and I think that's in one of the other MD documents. Yeah, I think that's in Kendra's brand new uh, yeah. live emergency plan. That's right. Yep. Having and said that, is some of that information rolled into here as well or are they treated separately? Uh, so they're treated separately. Mm -hmm. um, because a livestock emergency is usually not something you activate the ECC for. Right. Um, so it's it's not dealt with in a hazard specific plan. Um, and the other thing that I tried to do is I'm trying to stay away from if those numbers are already listed in, in the livestock emergency plan, I, I would suggest you don't want to double list them in this plan because then what happens is one plan gets updated, but the other one doesn't. Yeah, no lockstep. Yeah. Conflicting phone numbers or contact names or something. So I, I usually recommend to folks just pick one spot to put a certain phone number and make sure that everybody knows where to get those numbers, uh, which plan to get those numbers from. Because it's a lot of work for somebody to update these phone numbers. And, and if you got to double do it or triple do it in three separate plans, oh, it's a lot of time and effort. Agreed. And again, this I'll just send this to Rick, but um, again, under um, uh, what page would this be? Uh, page 197 of the Word document where they list uh, the supply of oxygen. Um, we don't have two bottles, we have one. So I just updated it. I can send it to Rick. Um, yeah, that's under the resource list. Eh? Yeah, exactly. And that instant command post trader, I'll, uh, one of my coming practice nights, we'll do a proper inventory and get it to Rick. <clears throat> and, uh, well, it, you know, some of these things are, I don't know why they're in the plan. You know, they're kind of like that amount of oxygen. That's that's a kind of an insignificant amount. Yeah. There's some people in wheelchairs that have more oxygen than we <laughs> than you do in your fire hall. So you know. Yeah. True. Yeah, I agree with you, Rick. Some of the stuff <laughs> in these lists is is probably not overly important. Okay. And lastly, was just that uh, uh, appendix C maps. And it's the first map, MD Bighorn Hamlets and surrounding communities. Um, I, I, I see you put Jameson Fire Hall, the red star. Uh, I just, yeah, and I mean, it, yeah, it says Jameson Fire Hall, that's clear, but I mean, it's not showing up under the, uh, the index as well. But do we want to show the other two fire halls on this drawing as well? For sure, there's a fire hall like right beside Penn's Lens and one beside Exxon. That's just for the group. It just implies only one fire hall. <laughs> Yeah. I think Rick's talking, but we're not here. We're not here. Well, yeah, I think if we let Ulrika know about that, she could fix that up pretty quickly. Okay. That's on the that's one of the maps on the website too, so they'll have an interest in fixing that. Okay. And I believe that was it for me. Thanks, Twain. Tom, I haven't heard from you today. You're on mute, uh, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to turn my microphone back off. Um, yeah, I, I think pretty much everything that uh, um, that I kind of noticed has already been noted by by others. So. Um, my, my only concern on this was, and it's typical, it's just housekeeping items. It's, you know, it, it is delineated in the, in the appendices, yeah, um, and in the package about, uh, um, exercising the, the ECC on a regular, on a, on a regular basis and making sure that it's done. And also I think it's critical that, um, you know, it's easy to say that these, um, lists get updated by someone in the office um, and from personal past experience with uh, a lot of this stuff that if it's not um, date sensitive and um, directed then it's really easy to slip through the cracks for a few years um, whether you could actually May do a better job by um, 
having other people like more than one person review that list right like uh like norm uh, has suggested there there are some other people able to provide services and uh uh you know and even our own staff could go through there and say this we don't deal with this supplier anymore and that sort of thing so i think we could probably do a little bit better job of uh you know keeping a good current list but we do we update it every year and we check all those contacts make sure they're, they're still current so uh, i can say that positively Okay, are there any more questions on the MEMP? Or uh, comments? I just went back through my list and I found one very minor detail that I had missed, but since we're correcting some things, I'll mention it. It's page 120. I would like to make that motion that this goes, that we are recommending this this document to council for consideration with the amendments that have been made today and previously. All right. Any discussion on the motion? Rick, you've got your hand up. Oh, okay. All right, all those in favor of Kevin Hebb's motion? Okay, thank you. Excuse me for interrupting. It's Leslie. We are definitely having some uh, bandwidth or connectivity issues. I'm going to ask that maybe you guys um, shut off your videos for right now. We're going to see if that helps out. Um, it's just dropping out. So I appreciate that. And um, yeah, you'll just have to go by voice, Rob, when you ask for a hands up. OK, fair enough. Sorry. No, oh, thanks, Les. All right, um, do we want to go back up in the agenda to update from districts and director? Verbal anyway. Um, would you like to do that? Have that conversation? I want to know if Wayne, would you like to start? Certainly. Um, so the update from Jameson. Um, it's been a while since we had a last meeting, so there's a number of stuff. I'll leave the uh, the incident calls to Rick. Uh, we have been doing uh, a number of calls with with Rick, supporting uh, supporting calls up on First Nations land in the Morley area. Um, grass fires at Ghost Lake, um, of course, some structure fires in Morley, but um, as for specific for Jameson, our um, 168 engine still remains out of service. Um, it is out in Exshaw at a uh, mechanical shop out there. Um, I think some people on the call know that the, there was a donor engine that was given to us and uh, we were getting a deal on dropping this donor engine into the, uh, the truck. Um, as well as doing a CVIC. Uh, the CVIC found some issues too in regards to the, uh, the, the park brake as well as a power steering box. So all in all, um, they had the donor engine was probably not as good as it looked like. Um, they had to, the heads on our uh, seized engine has been moved over and they're kind of doing a half rebuild or partial rebuild. And uh, I think Rick could probably add more to it as to the status as of today. But my understanding is the, uh, the call it the person. Uh, I think Paul Clark has a question. Uh, yeah, I do, uh, Wayne. Uh, when uh, the, the uh, Jameson Road uh, uh, fire hall was designed, why did we not put a hose tower in there, a uh, drying tower? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think. I'd, what I did way, way, way back is we had an issue with money. I could not get the 55000 to build that fire hall, but I was able to go look for um, partnerships or, or shared governments. So to to minimize what the MD had to pay, I, I found, you know, I don't know, fifth, I guess it was like uh, 18 grand from the federal government, 18 grand from the provincial government, and that just left the rest for the municipal but um, it's, it, it would have co added quite a bit of cost to the fire hall. But I mean, not to say it can't be built on now, but um, it just wasn't done. We, we 
we plan to build a third bay, perhaps. You've always left the infrastructure out of that third area on the west side so we could add a third bay, but never really has been talked to a, to put in a full-on hose tower. Okay. Uh, that sounds like you can obviously do without it. Yeah, um, this host system that we're putting in is is a rollable rack system. Um, it allows us to hang so many th so many feet of hose, um, get it dried up, and then move it out of the way uh, as necessary, or get the hoses rolled up and stored as well. So, it just I mean, for too many years now, we've been dealing with um, you know dirty hoses laying on the floor, washing them down, getting them clean, but then there's really nowhere to properly uh, let them dry. So, this is it'll be a welcome addition for sure. I believe in the capital budget, you also had uh, uh, new uh, racks for the uh, all the uh, personnel equipment. I think that was next year's budget. Um, oh, okay. We do have um, we do have that in the budget. We uh, we have a, uh, racks for seven firefighters now, and we need to buy another rack system. We have we've exceeded that with fire fire members, so one's doubling up. One family unit is doubling up, but yeah, so we have that in next year's budget, I believe. Okay. okay. Thanks, Wayne. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Uh, Tom. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I always have trouble finding my mic. Um, not a lot to report. Um, I think one of the main things we just had one of our members attend a um, medical first responder course in uh, in Canmore. Um, and so that, that'll give us uh, some uh, good advantage on going on medical calls, have a, another member with a, with a, an MFR uh, rating. Um, as far as, as business, far as business. Did, sorry, go ahead. Hello? Oh, uh, sorry, I'm getting an echo. <laughs> I thought it was somebody asking a question. Um, I was just getting an echo, sorry. Um, as far as calls go, it's just been, um, Towards the tail end of the summer, since uh, since uh, the Devil's Head fire, a uh, couple of grass fires, um, and it's been you know it's been fairly quiet. Um, like Wayne, we're trying to clear up, just clean up, just our our year end uh, um, capital purchases and having difficulty getting some stuff due to uh, due to supply chain issues from manufacturer. Uh, majority of stuffs manufactured in the U.S. There's a lot of uh, a, a real decrease in the manufacturing uh, capability in the U.S. for uh, some of the hose and that that we've ordered, um, and some of the stuff we're still waiting on. But um, uh, I think that's about it. All right. Thanks, Tom. Any questions for Tom? Paul, your hand is up. All right. Um, Rick. Okay. Well, I guess as far as uh, emergency management, <clears throat> uh, the work that we're doing today has been uh, been the most uh, most activity for sure. Um, we're going to get into some more training after this, but Rob did uh, mention the ICS training, ICS 200 course that was just finished. Uh, this week and we got another another one planned later in December um, so that's uh, that's good uh, we haven't done a lot of training for, in a, uh, for quite a while so that's a good sign uh, the other thing of course is the state local emergency that um, that Rob talked about for the devil said fire uh, so I I wasn't even around so I can't speak to that very much um, as far as Exshaw fire goes since our last meeting we attended 52 fire calls or um, incidents I'll say uh, nothing really I want to pick on or uh, of any significance we had a num quite a number of of uh, structure fires uh, all in the reserve um, we had quite a few uh, grass fires and um, and we had a couple of and uh, all three departments have gone to uh, downed power lines with all the wind we've been getting um, and I got to say you know this year 
all three fire departments to work together on many, many incidents. I, I haven't taken account, but uh, previous years, once in a while, we get together. But this year, I'd say we're probably, you know, nine or ten times we've had all fi- all three fire departments working together. And uh, that's either due to the size of the fire or uh, and the need for resources or lack of resources and we need resources sort of thing. So, um, and yeah, I think that's good to see us working together. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, what else could I say? I don't think there's too much else uh, without going into delving into any details. Uh, yesterday we received uh, all, just about, um, well, we've ordered 25 bottles uh, as a capital for SCBA. They arrived yesterday and we uh, we marked them up and they're ready we're, what we're going to do first is uh, the bottles that uh, came with our SCBA back in 2017, they're now due for recertification. The bottles have to be hydro tested every five years and they're due this month. So the brand new bottles are going to be <clears throat> uh, used to um, replace, temporarily replace the bottles that are already in use so we can get them recertified. And then uh, after they come back, we'll be able to distribute the uh, get the rest of the bottles uh, recertified, and then everyone will have a have three bottles for every SCBA in their in their inventory. So that's about all I have. Okay, thanks, Rick. Any questions for Rick? Okay, seeing none. Any general comments before we close the meeting? Robert, it's, it's Wayne. Hey, Wayne. Did we want to mention um, anything about two topics? One is the AFRAX radios, and the second one is is uh, the possibility of losing that loop start lines that we talked about sending a letter to the CRTC. Is it worth mentioning that to the group? Um, I think AFRAX radio is because it was approved, it was by, approved council. by council. Um, uh, Rick's got the information for that, but it was it's basically going to be rolled out over the next uh, three years. However, all the monies to get all the radios was approved by council at the other last committee meeting on November the 10th. So the budget's approved and the money for AFRAX was also approved. About 450, I believe, Rick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I got the I got the authorization to uh, to make the purchases as I as I need them, which is basically most equipment all right away. So we get them all programmed and they're all on the same platform, the same uh, same series of uh, software. So we don't, we've already found that we've got uh, four or five radios. They all look the same, but they got different software. In them. So each one has to be programmed individually. So we don't want to have that problem again. But anyhow, uh, we got to work on our fleet map and, and make sure we know what our programming wants to be. So in the next couple of weeks, I want to I'm going to definitely make an order uh, before December 15th because we got a discount, a uh, pretty significant discount. But I want to uh, talk to you guys and just finalize what our fleet map is, what we want our system to do for us. So I'll be getting uh, getting around to you guys eventually, hopefully next week. Can we uh, kind of tell our, our members um, kind of a, a basic date? Like I keep telling about this radio, it's going to say, you know, this spring or March or April that uh, we should be uh, functional? Well, uh, I had a counselor ask me that during the meeting and and uh, I said it should be within three or four months we should be uh, having these things in use. Like you'll have your, each member will have their radio, I would say in three to four months. No, sorry. Uh, Paul Clark, you have your hand up. I do. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, thank Stu and uh, uh, Rick and Rob uh, for uh, the time we spent on this report and uh, all of the other people who were obviously very diligent in going through it and uh, Kevin even finding commas. That was impressive. Uh, so um, um, with that in mind, uh, I look forward to the council meeting when this is going to be presented. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome, Paul. And I, I would echo uh, uh, Paul's comments to thank everybody for their input into the document. 
it's a, it's a long slog to go through it, but everybody has some excellent comments today, which uh, Stu will uh, make the change and incorporate into the final document that goes to council in early December. So thank you very much for all your input on that. Okay, seeing no more comments, um, could I get a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? Actually, before we do, do that, um, do you want to leave the next meeting to the call of the chair? Sure. Okay. Yes. Okay, now I'll ask for uh, for a motion, please, to adjourn the meeting. I'll move to adjourn, Norm. Yeah, he's got his hand up there. My okay, hand thanks, was Norm. up accidentally. <laughs> Make the motion, Paul. Okay, all in favor? You can you just say yay. Yeah. Yay. Okay, well, thank you again for all your help today and giving your comments and your patience going through this document. It's, it's, a, it's a big document and it'll certainly help us out moving into uh, the new ICS model that uh, we've been having our training session. So, so thanks again. Thanks, Stu.